Go ahead, Rodney. Okay. So, hello, everyone. Can you see my screen all right? Yeah. All right. So, most of you know me. My name is Rodney Hurt. I'm the one of the co-chairs of the GSC. Um, today, we're super excited for our, our seminar series. We have Dr. Hassan here to present to us. Um, before we get started with that, just want to recognize our GSC leadership team for this year. Roshan and I are the co-chairs, and we have our publicity team consisting of Reza, Rajmahan, Tarun, and Rachel. Take care of a lot of stuff for us. The support team of Anirban, Emmanuel, and Meghna also do a lot of stuff for us. And then a lot of our correspondence is through Robert and our uh, faculty advisor, our mentor is Farouk Mystery, also here today. Um, so just a big thank you to every one of these people. If you have any questions for the GSC, you can always reach out to any of us and we'd be happy to, to get in touch with you. And then we would like to invite you to our weekly meetings. So we have our GSC leadership team meetings every Friday at 4 p.m. Um, this year we're holding them via Zoom. So you can just send an email to myself or Roshan um, to get a, a meeting invitation. Um, at these meetings, we, we see how everyone's doing. We, we plan for future events. Um, so we would love to have input on, on other people's opinions or ideas of what we could do in the future to build a stronger community, um, have fun events, things like that. So please just shoot an email to myself or Roshan. We'd be happy to see you there. Also, um, we have our organization registered like with university. So if you could join our engage page, it's, it's similar to our old org sync. Um, by joining this, you just become a member of it. That helps make sure that the university knows our group is represented, represented well, and we can get in contact with everyone and keep everyone up, up to date on future events, things like that. So you can either use this link on the screen, which I'll, I'll share these slides so you can go back to the link, or you can scan this QR code and it'll take you to the page. You just log in with your OU ID and click join. Super simple. Uh, so I'll move on from that, but I'll put these slides in the chat so that if you wanna join, you can come back and just click on the link or scan the QR code. Uh, we also encourage everyone to check out our, our Facebook page. It, we keep it up to date with our um, future events, uh, seminars, and our, our past events. We have pictures to, to get people excited and let you all know what's been happening, why you should come hang out with us. And then We've, we've been doing our weekly seminar series all semester. Next week is the final week of the seminar series for this semester, uh, which I'm super excited about. It's uh, Chris Garno. I think I pronounced that right. But the, the topic is social predictors of political tolerance. So it's really exciting to me. It's not as technical in the engineering science, but we can hopefully learn a lot from it. So we would welcome everyone to join us again next week. And today we have Dr. Hassan from Egypt talking to us about um, optical and thermal performance enhancement of concentrating solar collectors. So before I, before I hand it off, again, thanks everyone for showing up and especially thank you to Dr. Hassan for being here. Um, if there are, during the seminar, if there are questions, quick questions for clarification, uh, those should be okay, right, Dr. Hassan? Yeah, totally. But then complex questions or, or time-consuming questions, we'll save those till the end so that we can keep moving through the seminar without too much disturbance. 
So with that, I will hand the screen over to you. We can get started. Yeah, so just a second. Um, okay. I'm not sure if the screen is now. Can you see my screen now? Yep. Oh, what's going on? <laughs> Wow. It doesn't like so. you. <laughs> uh, uh, do yes, I have to, like this, is it clear now? Without yes. uh, presenting? OK. Yep. Great. So again, my name is Mohammed Hassan. I'm from Cairo University. And um, uh, I received my uh, PhD degree, PhD degree uh, late 2017. Um, so my research interests are uh, mainly renewable and sustainable energy systems, their simulation, their modeling, their performance enhancement, uh, their hybrid, hybridization, and so on. Um, uh, recently, I started working on passive and low energy building systems and high performance HVAC systems. And we also, uh, sometimes we are focusing on uh, the use of data analytics, machine learning, optimization, and model predictive control in different fields. For instance, uh, the forecasting of power, BV, uh, photovoltaic power generation, and the model predictive control of HVAC systems, and so on. So uh, our research now in, in, in my department, or at least in my uh, research group, is somehow diverse, but we are making a bit slow, a bit consistent uh, grow, uh, uh, progress and so far. So these are the main themes of my research. Um, um, okay, sorry. So uh, I'll be talking about the optical and thermal enhancement of uh, the performance, uh, or sorry, the enhancement of optical and thermal performance of barbaric trough concentrators. Um, so I will start with a, a brief description of uh, concentrating solar power technologies. And then for the rest of the slides, I will be talking exclusively on about uh, barbolic trough concentrators. Um, I will be discussing their basic performance analysis, uh, their common methods of uh, uh, performance enhancement, and then what we are doing exactly in, uh, in sustainable energy research group, uh, my research group at Cairn University. And uh, I will be you know, giving some hints about uh, on some future uh, research directions. So, um, concentrating solar power is a, yeah, a collection of technologies that utilize concentrated solar radiation for heating fluids up for the purpose of uh, uh, generating uh, uh, electricity. So, it's uh, it's a common, it's a, a typical Rankin cycle or a typical steam power plant, but, but the boiler part, which is typically fired by coal, uh, oil, or natural gas, is replaced with some sort of concentrating uh, collectors. These collectors uh, use optical surfaces, like mirrors, uh, to concentrate the solar radiation, which is uh, uh, originally has a low in, uh, intensity uh, on, on lines or on points in order to maximize the intensity of this radiation for uh, to be sufficient for uh, heating the uh, fluid. So there are four main, four main categories or configurations of these systems, um, uh, like uh, the barbaric trough collector or concentrator and the linear Fresnel concentrator. And these two uh, concentrators, the, uh, the solar radiation is concentrated uh, on a line, theoretically on a line, but uh, practically it's uh, it's concentrated on a cylindrical receiver. This uh, cylinder receiver, cylindrical receiver, contains the fluid which is uh, to be heated. The difference between them is that is that the linear Fresnel, Fresnel uh, is in the form of segmented mirrors that are mounted on the ground. Uh, meanwhile, the barbaric trough uh, concentrator has mirrors parabolic mirrors that track the sun from, the, from sunrise to sunset. 
Um, the two other configurations are the solar tower and the uh, solar dish or the um, Sterling engine. And these are point uh, concentrating, uh, 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 point concentrating collectors, meaning that they use to access tracking in order to concentrate the solar radiation on a point. That's, that's theoretically, but practically they concentrate the solar radiation on a volume receiver rather than a, a line receiver or a cylindrical receiver. So um, the major share of the installed capacity of CSB technologies in the market are belong to the Barbot craft because it's the oldest one and it's, it is the oldest one in the market and it has been used in the SEGS uh, lamp, I think in Nevada uh, or Arizona, I'm not, I'm not sure, uh, but that is since the 80s from the last century. And they are well developed in the, uh, in the industry. Um, the uh, three other um, technologies are still under development compared to the Barmokhtraf, of course. And um, recently, uh, a lot of focus uh, from researchers and uh, practitioners is directed towards the solar tower because uh, the required area for generating electricity is somehow um, uh, lower uh, if you compare the uh, produced uh, electricity from both systems. So uh, until now, Robotraf is the most common technology, but it's getting a lot of uh, competitive uh, 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 performance uh, from solar towers. Um, why are, you, are we interested in considering solar power? Because of the many things you are aware of, such as the increasing uh, growth in energy consumption and global energy consumption around the world, the increasing uh, global average temperature, uh, average air temperature, the increasing uh, concentration of uh, CO2 in the atmosphere and so on. So a lot of focus is now directed towards uh, cleaner and um, sustainable, clean and sustainable energy production. Uh, however, uh, so far, the share of renewable energy systems in the market is almost less than 10%. Most of this share is, uh, is in the form of hydraulic power generation. <coughs> however, uh, other, uh, other technologies such as solar uh, power and uh, solar thermal power, uh, BV power and uh, wind uh, uh, power generation is still uh, almost marginal compared to the other technologies of power generation. Back to concentrating solar power, this is a schematic of how a concentrating solar power uh, system works. You can see that it's, it's a typical Rankine cycle this is a typical Rankine cycle. Uh, you have uh, a condenser and a bomb somewhere here, and the heat and the heat exchanger that uh, exchanges the heat from the heat transfer flow of the solar field to the uh, water in order to uh, generate steam to be used in a steam turbine, and the steam turbine is used, uh, as you know, for power generation uh, when coupled with a generator. So it's, it's a, a well-established technology on the uh, ranking cycle side. However, a lot of research is required in the solar energy or the solar field in terms of uh, how can you handle the unavailability of solar radiation during some hours of the day and during all of the night and so on. Um, however, this is considering solar power systems. Uh, if you use the same technology for thermal applications like uh, industrial versus heat and so on, you have unlimited uh, or uncountable uh, applications like as shown in this figure as uh, desalination, for example. So you can use it for desalination for large scale uh, uh, or district scale um, uh, uh, domestic water heating um, for HVAC applications in large buildings uh, and so on. Uh, so what is discussed in this slide uh, uh, covers both of them because uh, the presentation is focused mainly on the 
uh, concentrators themselves rather than the application. Uh, okay. So uh, barbox draft collectors are, as we said, uh, linear solar collectors in which the mirrors concentrate the solar radiation on the tubular receiver. Okay. Uh, the mirrors are either coated with a high selective coating um, or, uh, or covered with a highly reflective sheets in order to uh, reflect as much possible of the incident solar radiation on the tubular receiver. The tubular receiver or the heat collection element is composed of two, uh, um, two eccentric um, uh, cylinders. The inner one is called the absorber tube, and it is the one that contains the fluid flow. Um, so the solar radiation is concentrated on the black surface here on the absorber tube, and it has a selective coating uh, like ceramic or black chrome in order to maximize the absorbed radiation. And then we have the other cylinder, which is the glass cover. And its function mainly is to reduce the convection and radiative losses to the atmosphere or the surroundings. The annular space between the two cylinders is evacuated to uh, a pressure that is lower than one pascal, and that is to reduce the convective losses, the convection losses. Um, and the end part of the tube is um, um, has something called bellows, as you can see here. These bellows are um, like bended uh, metal uh, that is uh, added to account for the difference in the thermal and the uh, thermal expansion coefficients of the glass and the metal. So when the tube is heated and the uh, absorber tube and the glass cover are expanded due to the higher temperature, uh, the glass cover wouldn't crack due to the difference between the differences in the thermal. Uh, expansion coefficients. Um, this is a typical heat collection element, and you have also something called something called brackets. These brackets are used uh, for supporting the tubes <coughs> on the mirrors. Uh, a typical heat collection element or a, a typical re receiver module is three meters in length, uh, and the typical uh, parabolic trough module is twelve meters. So um, you have like um, three um, heat collection elements per each module, per each parabolic trough module. And then you have the uh, mounting frame, uh, which is, and the other, uh, uh, the rest of the steel structure. And this function uh, is simply to mount the mirrors on the ground. Um, and that's it. Um, typically, parabolic trough collectors operate in the range uh, of temperatures up to 400 degrees Celsius, uh, they can work at higher temperature, but the problem would be the instability of the heat transfer fluid, uh, as well as the excessive thermal losses on the heat collection element. Uh, and there is a lot of work to uh, is, is going on now to um, maximize or to um, increase the maximum operating temperature so as to increase the efficiency of the cycle. Um, if you remember uh, this uh, slide on the uh, overall blend, you know that this is a typical, a typical steam power blend. So uh, their efficiencies are already known, and there is a lot, there is not uh, a lot of research here because there is not a lot of space. Uh, there is not much space here for development. So most of the uh, focus in, in concentrating solar power plant is to improve the efficiency of the um, optical surfaces and the heat receivers here in order to uh, improve the efficiency of uh, the, the plant itself. Um, as I said, the rock trough concentrators are working with synthetic oils, uh, such as Therminol VB1, Cellferm 800, Dow Therm Q, and so on. Uh, but there are some experimental uh, fluids, fluids that are not uh, that haven't been used yet in uh, commercial systems, such as molten salts, um, which include solar salt, high-tech, high-tech XL, and so on. Uh, Small-scale barbuck troughs 
which are used mainly for um, domestic water heating and uh, uh, drying and so on, can use uh, fluids such as, such as water and ethylene and propylene glycols and so on. But uh, for, for large scale barbaric traffic collectors, uh, the working fluid is, uh, is usually synthetic oils, whatever the, what is the type of that synthetic oil. Um, okay. Okay, so there are also a, a lot of methods to track the barbaric trough. Um, a lot of configurations for that tracking and uh, most of the barbaric trough collectors use only one tracking uh, axis. Uh, which means that the uh, mounting frame is fixed on the ground and the, only the mirrors are tracking the sun from sunrise to sunset. And uh, if you want to maximize the, uh, the annual total uh, heat gain from these collectors, you typically uh, mount uh, the barbox trough collector so that its axis is in the north-south direction. But sometimes, depending on the application itself, you may prefer another orientation. Also, there are different, there are uh, uh, other types of two tracking or double axis tracking collectors, such as the one uh, shown here. This is called uh, bowler tracking, or um, um, I don't recall the other name, but it's called bowler tracking. The mirrors are tracking the same way from east to west. Uh, following the sun bath. However, the mirrors themselves, the, this tilt angle is um, changed from one day to another in order to, maximize, to minimize the incense angle. Uh, there is another um, configuration, tracking configuration like this one. This one use uh, dual axis tracking, but the tracking uh, is called full tracking or azimuth altitude tracking. Um, in this tracking system, and um, assuming that the tracking configuration and control is perfect, the collector will be uh, always facing the sun, which means that the sun rays will be always perpendicular to the aperture area of the barbuck trough collector. However, this is only used for research uh, purposes, and for bowler tracking, there is only one, uh, one such uh, commercial module. Uh, I think it was called uh, helium, helium 32. Uh, other than that, all, all barbuck trough collectors in the market are using single axis tracking. Um, this is a cross section in a uh, barbuck trough collector. It's just a schematic, not to scale, but these are the mirrors and, uh, and this is the receiver itself. This is the receiver. You can see here the absorber tube and the glass cover or the glass envelope and or the glass shell. Um, uh, so uh, given it's called a barbuck trough collector, the mirrors itself um, theoretically follow a parabolic shape. So this is uh, the governing equation. If you know the focal length, the uh, the uh, the distance between the vertex of the parabolic mirror, the lowest point here, and the focal point at which the sun rays are supposed to be concentrated. If you know this focal length, you can draw this uh, profile of the mirrors according to this parabola equation. Um, uh, aside from the focal length, you have two uh, other key parameters, which are the aperture width the distance between the two rims of the uh, parabolic trough. And the other parameter is called the rim angle. The rim angle is the angle between the line connecting the focal point and the vertex point, and the line connecting the focal point and the vertex point. So in this, in this schematic, the rim angle would be 90 degrees. Uh, 90 degrees. Uh, if you know uh, two parameters of the three parameters, you can get uh, the third parameter from either of these two equations. The three parameters are the focal length, the aperture width, and the rim angle. So it's assembly geometry. The, this basic one, this one, uh, the one that is used in the um, commercial designs. Uh, 
uh, and it can be easily uh, drawn for simulations um, in, uh, yeah, for instance, um, SOLIDWORKS or uh, CFD packages. So uh, you have also two key areas of the barbaric trough. The first one is called the virtual area, which is the area between the area between, um, uh, sorry, which is the product of the um, aperture width times times the length of the tubes, and this is the area at which the sun rays are are uh, falling on. Uh, the other area is the projected receiver area, which is simply the uh, um, by times the diameter of the absorber tube times the length of the absorber tube, which is. Uh, the projected area uh, that is on, on which the sun rays are concentrated. Uh, the ratio between those two areas represents something called the geometric concentration ratio, which is also um, represent the whole geometry of the barbaric trough. It is supposed to um, represent the optical performance of the barbaric trough, but it's not very representative because it's, it's just an area ratio and it doesn't include uh, a lot of optical um, uh, imperfections in the mirrors. Um, I guess we talked about that before. This is these are the values of the um, uh, of the heat uh, collection element, which are uh, which expand when the uh, when the tube heats up, in order to maintain the uh, the vacuum between the glass cover and the absorber tube. And these are the brackets. And the right figure shows a simple, um, a simple thermal resistance network of uh, a heat collection element. The uh, yellow node here is the heat transfer fluid inside the tube. And you have two nodes, uh, two red nodes uh, representing the inner and outer surface of the absorber tube here. And then we have two green nodes representing the inner and, out and outer surfaces of the glass envelope and the solar radiation the two components of solar radiation are falling on on the receiver one on the outer surface of the absorber tube and one on the outer surface of the green uh, sorry on the uh, of the glass cover okay um the instant solar radiation on the absorber tube um, is divided into two parts the first one is transferred by conduction to the inner surface of the absorber tube and then to the fluid uh, to form the useful heat gain, the amount of heat gain that you actually harnessed from the collector. The rest of the, rest of the heat transfer of the concentrated radiation on the absorber tube find its way uh, to the ambient and the surroundings in, in the form of convective and radiative losses. So you want to maximize this fraction of the absorbed heat and or and or to minimize the this fraction of the absorbed heat. Okay, in order to uh, evaluate the performance of the barbaric trough collector, you, you have to study it from different aspects, such as the thermal performance, the optical performance, the exergetic performance, the hydraulic performance, and you can also uh, study it from economic and um, uh, um, mechanical stress aspects. So uh, I will be focusing on only a few of these uh, aspects. Uh, in terms of optical performance, uh, as we said, uh, said before, uh, the absorbed uh, solar radiation on the, on the outer surface of the, um, of the absorber tube uh, either uh, is either absorbed by the heat transfer fluid, and which means that it's translated to a useful heat gain, or escapes from the glass cover to the to the surroundings and the ambient, and and in this case it's uh, thermal losses. Um, the optical efficiency is the ratio between the absorbed, sorry, the concentrated solar radiation on the outer surface of the absorber tube, and the incident radiation on the aperture area. So uh, Q absorbed is the amount of heat absorbed on the outer surface of the absorber tube. Uh, and QS is the incident radiation on the aperture area. This is the aperture area of the barbaric trough. 
and QS represent how much energy, how much uh, solar radiation is originally falling on the parabolic trough. Uh, so based on the ratio between those, you can determine the optical efficiency. Um, ideally, uh, you will be having something called the maximum optical efficiency, which is um, the reflectivity of the mirrors times the transmissivity of the glass covers times the absorptivity of the absorber tube. I mean, the efficiency is like, it's like the product of efficiencies of all optical surfaces, but also times something called the intercept factor. And the intercept factor is dependent on the geometry of the uh, parabolic trough and also the, um, the imperfections in the optical surfaces. So the intercept factor also accounts for the specularity errors and uh, surface roughness errors uh, in the mirrors, the slope errors in the mirrors as well, uh, as well as the um, misplacement of the uh, uh, receiver on the focal point. So for example, if you have a high wind loading, if you are installing your parabolic trough in a region or an area with high wind speed and giving, giving it a much time, you will notice some deformation in the mirror surface or some shifts, and this will uh, affect the optical performance of the parabolic trough concentrator. Um, this is the maximum optical efficiency you will ever get from uh, your uh, parabolic trough concentrator. However, this is only at um, zero instance angle. Zero instance angle means that the sun rays are, as shown in this figure, are perpendicular to the aperture area of the parabolic trough. But since most of the parabolic troughs are tracking the, um, the sun using only single axis tracking, the sun rays can be, um, can be instant with, a, with, an, with an angle, an angle between the sun rays and the normal to the aperture area. In this case, we multiply the optical efficiency. Uh, we, multiply, we multiply it with something called um, the instance angle modifier. And as you expect, it's a function of the geometry of the parabolic trough uh, and the instance angle of uh, the sun rays. So uh, in that case, um, when the sun rays are, are uh, falling with a higher angle, the efficiency, the, the optical efficiency will be lower. Okay. But um, since the mirrors are facing the uh, uh, receiver from only one side, and as you expect, the heat transfer, the heat flux on the absorber tube is not is non-uniform. Uh, in this case, the part of the cylinder of the half or the half cylinder that is facing the mirrors will be experiencing a higher heat flux. And the other part that is facing the sun will be experiencing a, a, a much lower heat flux. This figure shows only one part of the cylinder, uh, the right part, the, the right part here. And you can see that at this point, uh, the heat flux is like around 20, uh, 20 uh, kilowatt per meter squared. And, this is, and then it increases a bit and then it start uh, it started uh, starts to decrease again so the maximum heat flux will be at this point and then at this point and then it will be decrease it will be decreasing uh, until it disappears or almost there is no concentration of solar radiation at the upper part of the tube so this will uh, this will be an influential uh, point or a key point for many of the heat transfer enhancement um, uh, uh, methods that are being used in the literature, as we'll be discussing later. This type of analysis is used uh, when you are modeling your parabolic trough using a simple 0D or 1D model. However, if you are interesting, interested in more details, you can always use uh, an array tracing tool or array tracing model in order to trace the sun rays and see how much uh, the heat flux is actually um, affected by the uh, different design uh, 
parameters or the imperfections of the mirrors. For example, this is uh, an open source tool developed by NREL Laboratories in the US. It's called Salt Trace. And all, all you need is to uh, define the geometries, the dimensions, as well as, well as the optical uh, properties of the different optical surface, surfaces, either reflectors or refractors or receivers. And uh, it uses uh, a method that is called um, Monte Carlo ray tracing. Uh, in which you generate sun rays and trace them throughout the, diff the different optical surfaces of the system until they uh, eventually get absorbed or escape, escape the, whole, the whole system. Um, the intersections here shown in uh, black, green, blue, and red are the intersection points of the sun rays at different stages of uh, their path. Um, the yellow lines show the bodies of um, 10 sun rays from the sun and until they get absorbed in the absorber tube or escape the system again. Um, so you generate like 100, 1 million sun rays at least and uh, trace them to get a picture of what is going on uh, in this uh, optical system and where is the heat flux is uh, most concentrated and uh, what parts are not subjected to much uh, solar radiation and so on. Uh, this is another tool, it's called Tenatio, and it's also um, uh, an open uh, uh, source tool that you can easily uh, edit uh, and script in within. Uh, and it almost uh, does the same thing, uh, but it, ha it has another advantage of uh, easily defining tra tracking collectors. Because in Salt Trace, you need to uh, re-run uh, your model whenever you have a slight change in the position of the sun with respect to the uh, Barabok Traff collector. So um, once you, you receive it, once you determine your heat flux, you can define it in you can define it in your thermal model as a boundary condition on the absorber tube and the glass cover. <coughs> Similarly, you can, you can develop thermal models either as 0D models or 1D or 2D or 3D. Uh, it, it depends on what are you trying to do. So this is a, a well-known 1D thermal model for barbock draft concentrators, uh, either with a glass cover or as bare tubes. It was developed by Forstal, also from NREL Labs. And it's simply uh, the solution of a thermal resistance network that we have seen before. Uh, it's the same thermal resistance network, except that there is another uh, source of heat loss or another uh, fraction of heat uh, lost from the absorber tube to the brackets. The brackets are, are these parts. So it assumes also that there is another part that is um, uh, another part or another fraction of losses between the absorber tube and the brackets by conduction. Um, so you have uh, you have five surfaces: the inner surface of the absorber tube, outer surface of the absorber tube, inner surface of the glass cover, outer surface of the glass cover, and you got and you have all, also the um, uh, the heat transfer flow at each surface of this or at each node of this uh, of this system you can simply write your energy balance equations and then uh, break down the, each term of the heat transfer uh, modes into uh, a correlation or an empirical um, equation uh, to determine the heat transfer like to determine the heat transfer coefficient and so on so it's a simple model and it's uh, originally developed in uh, engineering equation solver. And if you check the uh, publication by Forstall, you will find the engineering equation solver um, code at the end, at the appendix of the report. Um, however, if you are interested in high fidelity solution like 2D or 3D uh, solutions, um, uh, for instance, if you are analyzing um, a complex geometry parabolic trough collector or a parabolic trough collector with a, a, 
a modified uh, geometry or a modified design, you will need you to develop your own uh, model or simply uh, edit the for style model um, depending or on your uh, uh, system. So for 3D simulations, um, you simply uh, obtain the heat flux distribution on the absorber tube and the glass cover and define them as boundary conditions on the glass cover and the absorber tube. And the rest is a simple um, case for um, um, a simple case for CFD uh, simulations. You, you simply need to solve the continuity, momentum, and energy equations. And uh, and if you are, um, if your flow is turbulent flow, which is the case in typical barbaric trough systems, you also need a barbaric trough. Uh, sorry, we also need a turbulence model. Um, typically, the K epsilon model is a simple and uh, very accurate one for this type of applications. Uh, also, you need a radiation model for simulating the radiation heat transfer between the absorber tube and the glass cover. And that's it. Unless you have uh, like a nano fluid or a different fluid that that requires a multi phase flow, uh, this these are only the equations you need to solve, and um, it's not very expensive simulations. Um, why uh, do would you need to perform three D simulations? Because a bit, um, Developing an analytical model may be challenging for very complex geometries of the barbuck trough, um, of the heat collection element of a barbuck trough collector. Also, you may be interested in some um, uh, aspects of the performance, such as the temperature distribution inside the fluid domain or the solid domain, or you may you might be interested in um, determining um, the velocity contours inside the absorber. Uh, tube and so on, these, uh, these uh, questions cannot be answered using uh, a 1D model. So you will have to switch to a high fidelity one. Um, in order to present your performance, your thermal performance, you use something called the thermal efficiency. And as you expect, it's the ratio between the useful heat gain, how much uh, energy have you gained from the fluid, <coughs> from the concentrated solar um, radiation divided by uh, the heat flux on the outer surface of the absorber tube. The rest of the QS is lost, uh, is Q loss. So the useful heat can uh, also equal the mass flow rate times the specific heat capacity times the temperature difference from the inner to the outer, uh, from the inlet to the outlet sections of the tube. Um, there is uh, something, uh, another efficiency term called the overall energy efficiency. It's similar to the thermal efficiency, but with another term uh, accounting for the bombing power. So if you need to get the overall energy efficiency of the system, you need to account for the energy required or the power required to bomb the flow, the fluid throughout the system. So you need to subtract the bombing power from the useful heat gain. But since the bombing power is an electric electric term, electric power term, it's divided by the electric uh, efficiency, which is um, typically around 32 or 33 percent. So, so the analysis so far is uh, very straightforward once you solved your uh, model or you simulated your uh, system. Um, typically, we uh, represent the performance in terms of nozzle number. And as you know, it's, it's the uh, heat transfer coefficient at the inner side of the uh, absorber tube times the inner diameter of the absorber tube, all divided by the thermal conductivity of the fluid. And the heat transfer coefficient is the heat uh, flux on the outer surface of the tube divided by the temperature difference between the absorber tube and the fluid bulk. And finally, you may be interested in the thermal losses from the whole whole um, heat collection element. So in this case, uh, there are two types or two mechanism, mechanisms of heat loss from the glass cover, uh, by convection and by radiation. And with some assumptions, with some very uh, acceptable uh, assumptions, or reasonable assumptions, you can use, you can simply use the um, Newton's law of cooling for uh, convective losses and 
use uh, the Stephen Boltzmann law for radiative losses, assuming that the glass cover has uh, a view factor of one toward the sky. I mean, you will be neglecting the view, the view factor between the glass cover and the mirrors. Um, for hydraulic performance, um, we typically re represent the um, hydraulic performance uh, in terms of the dimensionless number, the Darcy friction factor. <laughs> uh, you may also want to uh, calculate the pressure drop uh, throughout um, uh, the tube, the absorber tube. And as for the mass flow rate, we use uh, the Reynolds number as a dimensionless number to represent the mass flow rate. And all these values are should be uh, known for you uh, once you either before or after you perform your simulation. So the data reduction and the representation of the results are uh, quite straightforward. Um, for uh, the exergy efficiency, uh, for the ex exergetic performance, uh, you have the exergy efficiency, which is the ratio between the useful exergy and the solar exergy. The, uh, the useful exergy is the useful heat gain, the amount of heat you uh, collected from the sun, minus the mass flow rate times the specific heat capacity of the fluid times the ambient temperature, all times the log of the ratio between outlet and inlet temperatures of the, of the fluid. All that minus the mass flow rate times the ambient temperature times the pressure drop divided by the density times the mean flow temperature. So it's also straightforward to calculate. Uh, the available uh, exergy is simply the incident radiation on the aperture area of the barbox draft collector times one minus four by three uh, ambient temperature divided by the sun temperature. The sun is the effective uh, sun disk temperature, which is uh, typically taken as 6,000 kelvins, uh, plus one third T ambient by T sun to the power four. So um, also the exergy exer performance is simple to represent, but there are other, um, other aspects to be um, studied such as the entropy generation and so on, but I'm not going to discuss, discuss that uh, in this slide. Okay, any questions so far? No? Hello? Oh, okay. All right. I see there, there's a question in the chat, but we might be able to wait till the mm. end if you want. I'll, I'll leave it up to you. Okay, okay, I'll be continuing now. Okay, so, um, So before, as for performance enhancement, um, um, why to um, try to enhance the performance of a barbaric graph collector? Because as we said before, uh, there is not, there is no much space for enhancement of the performance of the other part was the typical part of the power plant, which is a rank and cycle. It's a, a totally different uh, field of research. So most of the focus here is uh, in concentrating solar power plant is either on the concentrators themselves or the thermal storage uh, board. Um, if you are interested to perform uh, some experimental work on these um, systems, uh, you have good news and bad news. The bad news is that uh, it's very expensive to perform uh, experiments on large scale barbaric trough collectors because as they are uh, already expensive the the system itself even before being modified <coughs> is very expensive uh, to install and to manufacture and to operate and so on so um, so most of the research is on either is done e either numerically or using um, prototype uh, barbaric trough collectors the good news is that these, those uh, prototype barbaric draft collectors are not that expensive. You can you can actually purchase like a whole setup for those studies, like this one. We have this one in our lab, and it's um, a two-axis tracking barbaric draft collector with a BV module for driving the 
uh, electric bomb and the controls and so on. So we just need to move it outside and perform our experiments. It's not very expensive. Um, or you can assemble your own um, uh, system. You only need our work draft concentrator, uh, a small scale one, um, a heat exchanger, um, a storage tank, a computer and data logger, um, like a single uh, single speed bomb and uh, a valve. That's that's it. So for for research purposes, it's it's um, it's not very expensive to um, to perform those simulations. Uh, sorry, those experiments. Um, the methods of heat transfer enhancement are can be categorized to active and passive methods of heat transfer enhancement or performance enhancement in general. Um, the difference between them is that, is that in active methods, the modified design actually consumes power, consume, consumes power to uh, elevate uh, the, the performance of the conventional design. Whereas in passive enhancement, you just modify, you make, you just make some modifications on the um, specifications of the materials or the geometry of the Barbuck trough collector in order to enhance the performance. So it doesn't uh, consume power, but we'll be talking about this point a uh, few minutes later. Uh, you can also um, perform optical uh, enhancement or thermal enhancement or combined enhancement. So some of the most common methods is using uh, secondary uh, reflectors, end reflectors, internal reflectors, uh, transparent insulation, selective coating, um, that's to uh, uh, enhance the, the, to maximize the uh, concentrated solar radiation on the absorber tube. On the thermal side, um, there is the use of nanofluids for enhancing the thermal conductivity and hence the heat transfer rate of, uh, um, the heat transfer uh, rate uh, on the absorber tube. Uh, some people are using corrugated tubes, alternative fluids, Boris media, and so on. I will be showing uh, showing sample of these uh, modifications, like uh, the use of inserts. The use of inserts is probably the most common solution in which um, uh, researchers uh, simply insert some twisted tips like this one or uh, coils like this one as um, turbi um, as turbulence generators or turbulators inside the absorber tube. These sample devices um, increase the mixing of the fluid inside the absorber tube, and hence they, um, um, they, they speed up the rate of heat transfer between the absorber tube and the fluid. And when the heat transfer rate is increased, um, you can use a smaller baroque trough to collect the same amount of power, or you can um, collect higher power, higher thermal power, or energy using the same size of the barbuck trough collector. Um, this is uh, a twisted tape insert with a cylindrical uh, rod. Uh, this in this one, we are using a cylindrical rod only to increase the heat transfer area. Some people are inserting um, uh, fins on the inner side of the absorber tube in order to generate some turbulence and also increase the heat transfer area. These are uh, borus uh, fins or borus discs inside discs inside the absorber tube. This is a flat or wavy, sorry, wavy um, insert. Um, these are some complex shape uh, twisted tube inserts. Um, the common thing is that almost all of these things uh, do enhance the heat transfer rate and uh, hence enhance the thermal performance of the barbell trough collector. But in the same time, they introduce extra pressure losses inside the, uh, into the system. And hence, I don't really consider them passive methods, although being, although being labeled as passive methods, I don't think they actually truly passive because after all, you will be consum consuming more power in order to overcome that pressure drop, that excessive pressure drop. So um, these are the common um, solutions. There is also the use of um, corrugated uh, channels or non-smooth fans, uh, non-smooth absorber tubes. For instance, uh, instead of uh, a simple cylindrical tube, 
these guys are using uh, a wavy absorber tube and these regions are um, ideal for generating uh, turbulence inside these simple regions, these small regions. Uh, also this one, this one is using outward, outward drips. These guys are using inward drips. Uh, all these uh, extra material or extra um, rates either inside or outside the absorber tube simultaneously increase the heat transfer uh, uh, area and also uh, introduce some turbulence inside the absorber tube. Um, some like radical changes in the absorber tube would be something like this in which the whole geometry of the absorber tube is changed. <coughs> uh, other people, uh, people use uh, disks uh, like this one. This one is like an inward drip, not, not like a disc, but sometimes they uh, fix uh, discs, uh, half cylinder discs uh, on one side of the absorber tube, uh, specifically the side that is facing the mirrors because it's experiencing uh, the most of the concentrated solar uh, radiation. Um, uh, this, this, these are easier uh, and these are almost better solutions they, they don't uh, enhance the heat transfer as much as the turbulators, but at the same time, they don't have, they don't introduce or increase the uh, bumping power drastically like the use in, of uh, turbulators. However, some, some solutions are more difficult to commercialize because they uh, disturb the uh, currently, um, the current standard standards of manufacturing uh, parabolic traffic collectors, so they may not um, be very uh, optimal for commercial, commercial solutions. There is also um, another category that is truly massive in this case, which is the use of secondary reflectors to either maximize the concentrated heat flux or to minimize um, the radiative losses. For instance, um, uh, these guys are using uh, a compound parabolic concentrator outside the heat collection element in order to reflect any sun rays that are escaping the system. They reflect them back to the absorber tube. Uh, the same um, reflector, compound parabolic reflector, has been also used inside the um, inside the uh, evac uh, vacuum space between the absorber tube and the glass cover. But as you can see here, the focal length. Um, the CBC will not be able to will not be able to concentrate the solar radiation on the focal length of the the original focal length of the parabolic trough mirrors. So uh, in this study, the authors um, decreased the diameter of the tube and moved it upward to be in the focal point of the CBC itself. Uh, this end reflector is used mainly to reflect back some of the sun rays when the incense angle is not zero. So if the instant angle are falling with an angle like this, um, some part of the tube will not be subjected to concentrated radiation. For instance, the sun rays at the be beginning of the trough will be falling here and then reflected at this part. So this part will be uh, con experiencing concentrated heat flux, but this part is not. So these mirrors are to, to reflect back some of the solar of the sun rays uh, to increase even the heat flux even more at this area to compensate for the area with no concentrated heat flux. Um, this is another solution in which uh, the researcher thought that uh, uh, since this area is subjected to concentrated radiation and this area is almost not subjected to concentrated solar radiation, so they thought they can fill this area with transparent insulation. Uh, this would reduce the convective and radi radiative losses to the ambient without affecting the optical performance a lot. Um, here we, you have a radiation heat shield in the annular space of the heat collection element at, and its function is to reduce the view factor between the absorber tube and the, and the sky so, so as to reduce the radiative losses. The same is here, some other uh, radiation heat shields, the same idea. Um, I guess I'm running out of time. So uh, another very, very popular um, category of heat transfer enhancement is the use of nanofluids. And as you know, the nanofluids are 
a mixture of base fluids and nanoparticles of diameter, a nominal diameter of less than 100 nanometers. <coughs> so the main reason for using nanofluids is that the thermal conductivity of the nanoparticle is way higher than most of liquids. So when you mix them and uh, produce a stable uh, mixture, the, th the thermal properties will be enhanced. But for the same reason, um, um, they, they do perform, they do usually increase the thermal conductivity of the uh, nano of the resultant fluid and hence the heat transfer rate will be higher than, uh, than typical fluids. But the main issue is that they also increase, uh, they also have a higher viscosity, which means that the uh, bumping, powers, uh, bumping power will be uh, also higher. Uh, if you are experimenting with nanofluids, you will need to manufacture, prepare them, and then characterize their uh, um, um, uh, their uh, like a nominal diameter and also study their stability. This is another major area issue in this type of studies. That is no, that is there is no um, uh, focus on the stability of nanofluids. Uh, no study have addressed this this issue yet. We all know that uh, the the cost of the oils, the synthetic oils in a CSB plant, is typically five percent of the cost of the whole power plant. So what if if you are using nanofluids which need to be replaced in a higher frequency? That will be a very uh, major issue. Anyway, um, in order, uh, in, if you want to um, perform simulations of nanofluids. Typically, researchers use use classic models of mixing in order to obtain the uh, thermal properties of the resultant nanofluid, uh, which are uh, functions of the thermal corresponding thermal properties of the base fluid and the nano particles, as well as the volume fraction or the concentration of <coughs> the uh, nano particles. So. Um, if you are using a single phase model, you will be using the same governing equations that we talked about earlier, the continuity, momentum, and energy equations. And that would be uh, the homogeneous uh, single phase approach. And it's almost like used in 99% of the literature or the studies in this topic. However, if you want uh, a more solid approach, you will be using a two phase approach. Uh, and in that case, the volume of fluid approach will be the most cost-effective one while uh, providing you with competitive accuracy to the other uh, two-phase approaches. Um, the, issue, the issue in this field, in the concentrating solar power field, is that we are using synthetic oils that are ma uh, mainly used for this application specifically, or we are using molten salts. In all cases, there is no there is no much literature in general on the uh, stability and thermal properties of these nanofluids. So, if you are performing some sort of uh, numerical simulations, you will not be uh, you will not, you will not easily find uh, the required models and the required measurements to help you or assist you in your uh, um, simulations or in setting uh, up your model. So there is a lot of research gap in the area of nanofluids and barbotraf collectors. I, I told you earlier that there is a lot of research, but um, I, I, I'm sorry to say that, but a lot, a lot of there is a lot of you know um, not very solid research uh, in this area. Um, what we are doing in um, in search. We have uh, uh, a full-scale barbock trough collector system, like 24 uh, meters in length and 5.7 meters as a aperture width. Uh, it's a, a two standard size modules as those, those that are used uh, in concentrating solar power plants. Uh, we use them for experimenting uh, uh, with uh, conventional designs and for testing the performance of barbock trough collectors and under different uh, design con uh, operating conditions. We also have a metallurgical station that um, uh, that we use for measuring the solar, the three components of solar radiation, the global, uh, the direct, and the diffuse one. 
as well as other meteorological parameters such as the ambient temperature, relative humidity, and so on. And we used, we used them for some uh, numerical validations uh, and or direct experimental studies. Uh, this barbuck trough system is, is now being extended to a solar biomass system. Uh, we are about to uh, receive uh, a fund of $3 million for that purpose to, the, to build the first uh, Egyptian pilot uh, solar power, uh, solar biomass plant for producing uh, uh, solar liquid fuel. Um, we also uh, perform indoor electric tests on the absorber um, tubes of barbaric trough collectors in order to characterize their thermal performance. This test is, is uh, performed by inserting an electric heater inside the um, absorber tube and then uh, he, uh, adjusting the input power uh, to the tube uh, and, operate, and waiting until the absorber tube reaches the steady state conditions. At, that, at this moment, we measure the absorber uh, temperature as well as the thermal losses. If you are reaching the uh, steady state conditions, the input power will be the input electric power will be equal to the thermal losses. So you can get uh, uh, like uh, uh, second order correlation between uh, the absorber temperature and um, and the uh, and the heat losses. So, for instance, if you want to validate your numerical work, you know that the absorber temperature is around five degrees Celsius above the fluid temperature. So if your flow temperature in your, in your numerical model is 200 degrees Celsius, then the absorber temperature is 205 degrees Celsius. And you calculate the thermal losses from the middle model and compare them, compare them with uh, the thermal losses from the experimental uh, figure, this one. Um, we also um, published a study uh, early this year on the optimization of nano fluids in barbaric trough uh, collectors. Uh, we performed optical simulations in salt trays, uh, and then we defined them or coupled them with a CFD model in ANSYS. <coughs> but we have uh, to reduce uh, the, uh, the 3D model to a 2D, a quasi 2D mesh, in order to uh, be able to run like 5,000 simulations with, with uh, moderate computational costs. And then these, uh, these re the results of the CFD simulations were then fed to uh, a neural network in order to uh, reduce, in order to develop a reduced order model that can be used to predict the energy and the exergy efficiencies given uh, the uh, incident solar radiation, the inlet temperature, the real number, and so on. And then we use that neural network um, in a multi-objective optimization using the NSGA uh, algorithm uh, in order to uh, find or spot the optimal operating and design conditions that would mix, maximize the both the energy and the exergy efficiencies of the parabolic trough collectors when operating with nano fluids. And these were where the maximum efficiency, the exergy one was like 70% and the maximum, the maximum exergy efficiency, efficiency was uh, around 32 uh, percent. In another study that was published like two weeks ago, we used a uh, radiation heat shield inside the inside the uh, another space, and we followed uh, like a similar, almost similar approach, at least in the model development. Um, and we tried to optimize the angle, the angle of the uh, radiation heat shield, the intercept angle. Um, as well as the location of the radiation heat shield within the another space and uh, map the performance, uh, the energetic and the exergetic performances of the barbaric trough collector uh, when using radiation heat shield. So um, um, in conclusion, we found that we can uh, improve the energy and the exergy efficiencies by 15 and 14% with only a, a sheep uh, one millimeter thick aluminum sheet even without selective coating. Um, we also used a temperature temperature resistant uh, sorry temperature resistant transparent insulation <coughs> within the under space. This would this is a, a shell of um, transparent insulation that is that can resist the very high temperature inside the under space. Uh, as you can expect, it would be uh, reducing or decreasing the optical performance because it has its own transmissivity. 
uh, but in the same time, it will be capturing the um, heat within the um, um, absorber tube. It will be reducing the convective and radiative losses, and that would be the case. We propose we propose this solution as an alternative to the evacuation of the heat collection element. So in general, we found that using uh, unevacuated heat collection element with a, a simple and co and uh, cheap uh, transparent insulation shell would be even better than using an evacuated collector, an evacuated heat collection element. Um, the, uh, to be in the picture, most of the cost in the CSB power plants is most of the operating costs are due to the replacement of the heat collection elements, which are already the most expensive part of the of the plant. So our focus recently was on developing alternative solutions to the evacuation itself, and this one was one uh, of those solutions. Um, another active solution. This this time it's an active solution. Uh, <coughs> We started is the rotation is developing a rotating mechanism of the heat collection element regardless of the rotation of the mirrors themselves. Uh, so the mirrors will be following the sun rays from uh, or following the sun from sunrise to sunset. Uh, however, the tube itself will be rotating at very low speeds in order to mix the heat transfer fluid inside the absorber tube and uh, in order to generate more turbulence and. Um, we again found that this is even better than, than an evacuated tube uh, with no rotation. The evacuated tube with no rotation is in blue. However, the red line uh, shows the uh, uh, useful heat gain if you are using a cracked heat collection element. A cracked, uh, cracked heat collection element is, uh, means that there is no uh, vacuum in the inner space, uh, but with a 10 radian per second um, rotation. And we tested, the, uh, we even extended the models to 3D models, um, 3 mod, 3D steady, uh, st sorry, 3D unsteady simulations during four uh, days um, of operation using meteorological data from the uh, the solar station that I showed you earlier. And we also tried to uh, to determine the period at which the the rotation of the heat collection element will be effective. So we, we also suggested that like operating the or rotating the heat collection element like for three or four hours only during the day will be very effective and will almost negligible uh, extra costs. Uh, we, all, we are also exper experimenting with other, other solutions such as direct and indirect absorption by wave traffic collectors. We started also working on molten salt based nanofluids. But, but most of this research, research is still under development. Uh, in my opinion, the most, the major issue in this um, topic of research is there is no adequate, if any, um, studies on the technical economic evaluation of those enhanced design barbopetraf concentrators. This is understand, understandable if you remember that I told you that it's very expensive to experiment with these uh, modified designs uh, experimentally, <coughs> um, most of the solutions, I, uh, as I mentioned earlier, are not truly passive. They introduce uh, turbulence, yes, but they increase uh, the pressure drop and also increase the bumping power. Some of the solutions, such, such as the use of nanofluids, is even questionable, even though I, I worked on these topics before. But I'm not sure if this is a suitable application for nanofluids because um, you need a high stability of um, of the heat transfer fluids in such systems. Uh, the fluids are exp experiencing uh, frequent uh, cycles, frequent temperature cycles, and they are operating at very high pressure and temperature. So I'm not sure if how I mean how practical is nanofluids for this type of uh, uh, applications, there is a huge shortage in experiments on full scale barbell trough collectors. Uh, I believe the first one I saw is was published like two months ago in China. They started working, uh, experimenting with barbell trough concentrators with secondary reflectors. Um, um, 
there is a, a shortage in the re, uh, reduced order modeling of modified uh, barbaric traffic collectors, which is the reason why the technical economic evaluations cannot be even handled using um, numerical uh, models so far. Um, hybrid nanofluids and the use of multi-phase uh, models is still um, not very common. Most of the studies are using um, single phase uh, homogeneous uh, approaches, which is in some cases not very accurate, in some cases such as in the cases of molten soil. Um, most of the focus, as I said, on, on um, are not is not on true passive methods. Uh, there is no much research on the um, on on solutions for evacuation or alternative alternative methods, alternative to alternatives to evacuation. This will be drastically uh, reducing the cost of the uh, receiver. Um, there is also no no benchmarking studies, which means that. You will, if you read in this uh, literature, in, in this part of the literature, you will be uh, finding a lot of discrepancies between the reported enhancement in some studies and others. So um, 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 we, you know, we desperately need uh, uh, like benchmarking studies in order to direct the um, research in the right directions uh, for future. Um, sorry, I passed the time and I tried to rush as much as, as I can, but uh, this is this was my uh, last slide. I need to drink a lot of water. So, uh, thank you. It was an awesome presentation. Um, would you mind if we start on questions with the one from the chat? Yeah, sure. I think. Uh, Lynn, can you correct me? I think we were around slide 19 when that came up. Nineteen, yeah. I, I think so. Uh, Lynn, are you there? Maybe she can't come right now, but. Do you, um, can you see the question? Oh, one second, please. Um, uh, how to... I think you can get mm -hmm. to the chat if you go to the top of your screen. I have the mini screen, if you know what I'm talking about. Um, yeah. Or it looks like Lynn is back. Can you just uh, ask it again? Yeah. So um, I, I'm not in this area, uh, but I had a test problem very similar, but it's a very simple one to design a thermal system. So I wonder, um, because the thermal, thermal system, um, some mechanical engineering students told me that every thermal system is designed for a particular use. Uh, there is no um, general design for uh, different uses. So I just want to ask um, uh, for the concentrator, are the, their locations, uh, do their locations matter? Uh, for example, the, the, the system located in tropical area and the temperate zone, they, because the sunshine, the, the solar energy uh, characteristics are different. Is there any um, differences that need to be considered? And also the seasonality. Um, For example, in winter, the sunshine uh, is not that strong and the, the angle is different. So do your systems uh, have this mechanism to adjust um, accordingly? Um, Typically, uh, barbaric trough concentrators are, are operating whenever the sun, whenever the direct solar radiation 
uh, is higher than 120 20, uh, watt per meter squared. So yes, there is a limitation on the concentrated concentrated um, um, on the level or of radiation intensity, but uh, you can operate them in regions like moderate uh, climates, like in Europe. But uh, if you did so, you will have to consider other aspects such as the economic aspects. These systems are very expensive, so unless you're uh, you have um, uh, a high level of solar radiation, like 500 watt per meter squared uh, and higher. Um, other than that, I don't think it will be justified to use uh, barbotraf concentrators. Uh, for example, in Germany, they have advanced research on renewable energy systems, but in solar energy systems, they are mostly focusing on uh, BV and BVT systems. Um, also, the low temperature uh, collectors they don't have a lot of research on uh, concentrating solar power. Most of the research actually is is implemented either in Spain and uh, Cyprus and uh, or the North African uh, region. Um, and they, they then they are uh, thinking of connecting that to the Europe using an, um, a single network because the solar radiation levels in Europe uh, in Europe are not um, are, are not very high. Um, um, uh, considering the uh, rains, uh, rainfall and so on, uh, I guess that would be a problem during the operation of the Warburg trough concentrators because the tubes are typically high. So that would be, may not be an opt optimal, op I mean, um, they, that will be, uh, may cause some problems like thermal crack on in the glass covers and so on, but um, but unless you have heavy and uh, high frequency days of uh, of rainy days, um, that would be a, that shouldn't be a problem. Um, not sure what was the rest of the question. I'm sorry. Um, most of the application of the installed systems are in Spain. Um, Southern Europe, North Africa, Australia, and so on, the regions with high intensity of solar radiation, uh, so that the um, harness power, harness thermal power would be cost effective. If that answered your question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, sure. Are there, are there questions from other people? Uh, Reza or Emmanuel, do you have questions? If not, I, I had one question, maybe yeah, two. Sure. Um, uh, I think it was slide 26, or it, it doesn't really matter, the inserts to induce turbulence. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you use those, do you have to consider um, like uh, deposits or any buildup, any extra buildup that could happen on those, or I guess it really depends on which one we're looking at. But uh, build up for, like, for like perforated sheets could get yeah maybe clogged and then have an even higher pressure pressure difference across that's, it. That's true. Actually, I have never I I only seen that this configuration only when I was beginning the slides. Um, I guess the authors in that study were, were like uh, simulating a laminar or a slightly turbulent flow. Otherwise, it, this would be a, a huge problem for the flow. Yeah, it will be, it will be uh, blocking the flow, yes. Um, um, there are uh, something that we th thought of before because uh, when you look at these uh, figures, you it seems that they are like arbitrary selected geometries, right? Mm -hmm. So we something we thought of is to perform something called topology optimization, topology to, topology optimization, um, in which we just defer, uh, in just in which we just um, um, define the general aspects of the geometry we want to insert inside the tube. And then um, uh, within the optimization, it will be 
we will be uh, uh, you know uh, iterating until we obtain a final shape of the uh, turbulator that fulfills our requirements for instance maximize the heat transfer minimize the pressure drop and minimize the cost of the material or in other words the uh, volume of the solid material uh, without forcing any special preferences like like this one is like it's a special preference of the of the researcher but we don't want to do that we don't we want it to be a, a data driven problem like you simulate and you evaluate your solution and so on the problem with that uh, was that uh, to do so we had to do we had to couple our optimization algorithm with the solution tool the simulation tool which is which was ANSYS in that case and um, you know that in multi objective optimization the number of iterations was is huge so uh, as well as which is the same as the um, simulations in ANSYS they are very expensive so unless we have a supercomputer that was uh, infeasible for us so um yeah um, some 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 geometries like these are introduce very high pressure drop like the boris media and so on but in general the simple twisted tape uh, tapes are very efficient and you can um enhance the performance for up to 50 percent or even larger with small extra cost of the metal you insert okay neat Thank you. Oh, the other question? <laughs> uh, the only thing I was curious about is um, your opinion, I guess, on like moving forward. Do you think the like the parabolic troughs are more more uh, will be more widely implemented than say like a solar tower? Yeah, or, I mean, because, they might be already. I, I'm not. Oh, yeah, the, the ops still, may, yeah, I mean, in, term, in terms of the scale of implementations, the are still the major share of the, in the market, even still uh, till today. Because the other technologies, <coughs> <coughs> the other technologies such as the solar tower are still, you know, um, are not as developed as the parabolic traffic collectors. Uh, if you noticed when I was talking that the rim angle is nowadays is 80 degrees, the aperture width is 5.5 uh, meters, the uh, length of the module is 12 meters. That's because there is a lot of, there is a long history in the development of parabolic traffic collectors. And uh, nowadays, almost all commercial, all full scale commercial models such as LS2, LS3, uh, Eurotrough, Heliotrough, and so on, almost have the same dimensions, uh, the same specifications. The differences will be the uh, some differences in the optical uh, characteristics of the coating. Um, I mean, the structure, the steel structure itself, but not in the um, optical and thermal performance of the, uh, or the geometry of the barbell trough itself. And that is not the case in solar tower. The solar tower is not, it's not uh, as a well-developed uh, technology as barbed trough, but it will be very, uh, it, it, it gained a lot of interest uh, and a lot of momentum recently, specifically in the last five years or so. Uh, and it's projected to be, you know, competitive to barbed trough within the next 10 years, it will be almost the same. Uh, another advantage of barbed trough collectors it, is that it can be customized to different applications of different scales. This is not the case of solar tower. If you have a symbol like a dissemination unit or symbol system, you don't um, you don't um, install solar tower, even if it would be requiring a smaller uh, field area. There are a lot of challenges in the solar tower uh, systems because you have a very high uh, concentration ratio and the temperatures are very high, approaching 1,000 degrees Celsius or so. So um, sometimes the use of liquids is not even feasible. Some, some systems use molten solids, uh, molten uh, metals. So that's a total different story. So I, I guess barbecue will be in, in the lead for, 
for a while, uh, for, I mean, two, 20 more years or so, unless something happens. Okay, thank you again. Um, Those were my, my main questions. Uh, Baroque or, or Reza, do you have any, any questions or, or comments? I have a comment. Uh, Mama, this was very interesting. Uh, what is what I'm, I'm thinking about here is that what are the frontier issues that you're dealing with? That is way beyond, let's say five years from now, 10 years from now, uh, with the use of uh, information technology, data mining, uh, uh, policy making, stuff like that. What are some of the issues that you think are important? I mean, really speculate, think way ahead, not about solving the problem, but what is the high level problem that you would like to deal with? I'm sorry, but uh, last question was, uh, Dr. Mistry? Yeah. Oh, yes, sorry. Th this is for my question. Yeah. My question is the following. You've done this. Mm -hmm. You've got a base, a basic thing saying these are the technical problems that I'm going to deal with. Mm -hmm. right? Now, there's a huge amount of disruption taking place in terms of information, data, uh, data being available, this being uh -huh. available, that being available. How do you what? How do you see this being used in connecting communities, for example, in in uh, in uh, uh, people working together to design this sort of stuff? Um, I guess uh, if there is an, 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 uh, a new whole research area in this um, in this technology, it would be the I mean, a typical use of data mining and Internet of Things and so on. It would be the um, the management and the the management of power generation systems. Uh, or the control. This is a typical area for this type of research. But you will need to. Um, I mean, how to? How should you schedule your uh, operation in order to? Uh, in order to um, fulfill a certain load, a certain uh, electric power, uh, uh, electric power load. If it's a CSD plant or a, a, a certain thermal load, if it's a concentrated solar thermal uh, blend uh, with the minimum cost of operation and the minimum size of the storage unit. The advantage is that makes, uh, uh, makes uh, the main advantage of concentrating solar power systems uh, compared, for instance, to uh, uh, photovoltaic systems is they can be dispatchable. They can be used thermal storage in order to uh, operate for like 24 hours. Um, so, um, however, the cost of that thermal storage is very expensive and also very challenging. So, if you have like, if you want to implement the concepts of big data and so on in this um, in this field, you will be um, you will be uh, focusing on the model predictive control of the power plant and the scheduling the um, uh, the operation of the power plant in order to, um, um, I, as I said, to, in order to fulfill uh, your requirements with the least um, hours of operation or the least uh, cost of uh, storage. But I don't think we have so much data as you may think. Um, um, there is no networking, no um, shared data, open, openly access, accessible data so far. So I'm not sure when will this be uh, a topic for research, to be honest. This is done with BV systems because, uh, because they are less expensive. Um, they are, uh, there are a lot of networking and um, database, uh, online databases for such studies, but not in the field of concentrating solar power so far. So, Thank you. All right. No problem. All right. Um, any any other final questions or takeaways, comments? Emmanuel, anything? 
Raisa or Elin. Mm, I have uh, no particular questions. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, it's a huge amount of work and very interesting. Uh, um, I actually a very question. Have you used any um, kind of systems dynamics or agent-based modeling or energy system analysis? I'm sorry, I have, I, I used what? Can any systems dynamics models in, in your analysis? Yeah, but that was in my master thesis. Um, oh, okay. uh, yeah, I was in, in my master. I was I worked on barbuck traffic collectors, like for just a part of my uh, of my uh, master uh, of my uh, master works. But I then switched to another uh, different in beach. Yeah, and I, I came uh, to the same topic was a different approach in the uh, in my post uh, doc studies. So yeah, I, I I'm familiar with. Um, uh, system dynamic modeling. You mean like uh, open Medellica and so on, or like this type of simulations, right? In a, in a more policy level, in a more strategic level, not, not so much in depth, but more in the horizon of the energy policy analysis. I, oh, no, no, I haven't. Not yet. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, well, I guess if there's no other questions, thank you again for for hosting or for uh, presenting at our seminar. Um, and especially thank you for for staying and answering questions. I know it went over time a little bit, but we're grateful that you were you're willing to answer questions for us. Um. Thank you all for seeing the seminar and I wish you a very nice night and